Well, good morning, church. It is so great to have you join us this morning. Uh, a few announcements just to get us started. Uh, again, we have people calling around, checking in on every single one of our members. And uh, if you have not been called at this point, please contact us, 803-635-3228. We would love to get in contact with you, see if there's anything we can do for you, uh, see if there's any supplies we can get you. We know that this time is really hard on everybody, and we want to be able to take care of each other in the way that the church can. Uh, again, the people are going to be calling again this week. If you've already been contacted, we just want to stay in contact with you. And so uh, if you don't know anybody that has been contacted, check on your neighbors. Check on the people uh, that are not a part of this church that you might think about and know about. Just be a loving, caring neighbor. Be an example of good Christianity. Uh, also, our online giving is still up. Uh, we've had a lot of success in being able to use it. Uh, there's, a there's a link that you can click on our Facebook and on our website uh, that's pinned up there that you can just click on that. That will take you to this little portal. You enter in your credit card information and you can give online without even having to leave your home. It's fantastic uh, to be able to do things like that in this time where we cannot gather together. Uh, another thing, we want to thank profusely the Boyds and Judy for coming out and singing last week. Uh, I think that is a blessing to everybody. Uh, when we can't come in and sing together, it is so wonderful to be able to have these little things that we can just latch on to and have the church come to us. Uh, that is on our Facebook page, and so if you haven't seen that or if you want to see it again, worship this morning, just scroll down on the Facebook page. You'll see it again and have some worship. God bless. Well, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in this time where we cannot meet together, uh, where we are just so distraught about not being able to meet together, and we just pray that you would provide us with comfort and strength in this time. We are so thankful for the avenues that you have created, such as the Internet and uh, videos that we can put up to still reach people with the Word of God. Lord, we are thankful yet again for uh, the many ways that we can stay connected with one another. And we pray that you would help us be the church in this time, that we would still be able to check in on each other and do your will in reaching out with the gospel. Lord, we pray that you would come to us, let us worship you, even though we cannot meet as we're preparing for Easter, this celebration uh, that you went to the cross on our behalf. We pray that you would comfort us and let us come seek you, find you in this time of need and that you would meet us. Lord, we pray that you would be with this message, illuminate it in our hearts, in our minds. In your holy name we pray, amen. Well, let's go ahead. If uh, you would please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning, and uh, I think we're going to have a great time. I, what I want to do is I want to talk about plans. Uh, for the past several weeks, all of our daily and weekly and monthly routines have been entirely disrupted. Uh, we've seen this quarantine slowly increase in magnitude and intensity as businesses start to limit their hours of operation, as they increase safety standards, as the precautions go up, and our, our, we start to limit our resources as necessary and uh, get the supplies where they need to be first and foremost, take care of our hospitals. Uh, governments have been trying to make sure that our hospitals have enough beds, ventilators, and other supplies that they need. And if I'm correct, South Carolina, we're actually sitting in pretty good shape. I think we have excess. And that is just wonderful to hear that our hospitals are getting everything that they need. Individually, we have been asked to stay at home as much as possible, social distance when, when we need to go out. And uh, our vacations have been canceled. Retirements are in trouble. And it seems that our, all of our best laid plans have gone awry. They're dust. Now we're busy planning on how to work around or despite an e epidemic, how to work from home. What should we do on the other side of all of this? What do we do? 
when all of this is over and we finally go back to some semblance of what is normal? Is there such a thing as normal after this? Is our world entirely changed? What do we do? And this is perhaps what is on most of our minds. Church, there is little I want more right now than have all of you back here in these pews to see you, to worship the Lord together. There's, there's little more that I want than you to be able to come down, pray at, this, at the front of this church and worship the Lord as he truly deserves. That is really what I want right now. And man, I want the doors of Stephen Green open. And it's going to be so difficult to celebrate Easter without you. But as we celebrate with our families in our homes, we can still worship the Lord well. It's going to be difficult to celebrate Easter, but just because it's different doesn't mean that it still can't be meaningful. And so some of you might even get new traditions during this time. How cool would that be if you start a new tradition because of this that carries on? And so last week, we talked a little bit about the plans and the preparation that God commanded for the Passover. The exodus happened so fast that the people had to uh, bake unleavened bread because they just didn't have enough time to bake bread the proper way with yeast in it. And so they ate this with their Passover meal, with this lamb that they had slain and they had taken the blood of the lamb and they had put it on the doorposts and on the lentil above the door. They were told to eat in haste because once this plague struck, they would be demanded, it would be demanded that they leave. And so they had to plan accordingly for something that was going to happen very fast. And this virus, when when all of the shutdown and everything kind of happened with us, it hit fast, but we are just now finding out how we were not really prepared as we thought we were. And so if we fast forward in time to the book of Matthew, What would we expect to find as people come to Jerusalem for this Passover celebration? According to uh, the historian Josephus, there were millions of Jews who would regularly come to celebrate in Jerusalem. So there's a lot of planning and preparation to be done in order to celebrate this properly. Uh, The Feast of Unleavened Bread, they would take all this time to get all of the leaven in their houses out, and they would take it to the city square, and they would burn it. Uh, so that there was no leavened bread in the household when the Passover began, as is the command back in the book of Exodus. And so there's a lot of preparation to be done, and millions of people are doing it in a very small space. Jerusalem is, it's big, it's not that big. (laughs) There's a lot of people in a very small space. And so what would we expect to find? Well, as we look at Matthew 26, we learn a lot about the different Passover plans of several different groups. And I'm going to skim here at the beginning, uh, jump around a little bit, so I hope you can keep with me. In verse 3 of chapter 26, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. And so we see that the chief priests are planning to arrest Jesus in secret. They're going to seize him, and then they're going to wait until the Passover is over, until the celebration is done, and then they're going to kill him once the crowds are gone away. Now, this is, uh, they're scared of a riot breaking out. Uh, Big crowds can be very unpredictable, can't they? Especially if toilet paper's on the line. Uh, The day that we are celebrating today is most widely known as Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem on on a donkey. And as he was coming in, the people were shouting uh, praises to him. They were quoting Psalm 118. They were going out and saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're attributing all of these things, very messianic titles to him during this time, and he is coming into Jerusalem. And they're very hopeful. 
and the crowd is with him. And the Pharisees see this. The, the chief priests see this. And they go, that's a big crowd. I am not going to mess with that crowd. They are behind him. We'll start a riot if we arrest him and kill him. And so we're going to wait until this all blows over. And so their plan is to wait and keep quiet. If we look down in verse 6, we see another figure. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why the waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but do you will not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, this woman, what she has done, will also be spoken of in memory of her. Uh, John chapter 12 attributes this to Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And so her plan is to anoint Jesus with this oil, to honor him. Uh, she wants to honor Jesus. This is what she is doing in preparation for the Passover. If we look just right after that, verse 14, we see another figure. When one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. And so we see in this time of preparation, Judas is planning and preparing to betray Jesus. And he went to the chief priests and had this, had this done. Meanwhile, what are the other disciples doing? Verse 17, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city, a certain man, and say to him, the teacher says, the time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And so it is very possible that this is actually the reason that Judas was able to sneak away from the group is the disciples are in charge of take, making sure the Passover is prepared properly. Uh, they, that would involve going down to the temple, making sure that they can get a lamb to be able to sacrifice, making sure that it is spotless, blameless, and that they would be, able, you know, without defect, that they would be able to take it to the temple and then have it slaughtered and then bring it home to be cooked and, you know, prepared properly for this Passover meal. They would involve making sure that the house that they are in, first of all, they had to arrange where the house was going to be. Then they had to make sure it was free of leaven, uh, that there was no leavened bread anywhere in there. There's a lot to be done here. And in the midst of that, Judas is the guy who is the treasurer. He is taking care of all the money. And so they just assume, okay, he's buying something. He might have been able to slip away and go make that deal with the priests under the pretense that he was actually helping prepare for the Passover. Fascinating. But I'll ask you another question. What is Jesus preparing for? We look back at verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Similarly, when we get to the actual meal, verse 20, he also repeats this. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with his 12 disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, Who dipped his hand in with me? He who dipped his hand in with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. 
And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it's not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. So what is Jesus preparing? He's preparing his disciples for his death. He's been telling them repeatedly, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and he will be handed over and crucified. And it seems that they aren't quite picking up on that. I don't know where their head is at, but it's not there. Uh, They think he is going there to be honored. Uh, In John 13 through 17, uh, this explains a little bit more of what is happening here. In these chapters, it's called the Upper Room Discourse. It is one of the largest teachings of Jesus in the scriptures. And it describes, uh, all through these chapters, he is describing how he is trying to prepare his disciples when he is just hours away from being arrested and handed over for crucifixion. And so he is trying to get them ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, be prepared. You're not quite there. You'll, you'll understand this later, but I need to tell you all of this now so that you are ready because you don't see what is coming. He is trying to prepare them for the pain and loss that they are about to go through. I would encourage you, if you are going through a difficult time right now, go read John 13 through 17. And I'd encourage you to read it in one setting. Read it in the mindset that this, is, this might very well be one of the last times he talks to them before the cross. He knows what he is headed towards. And I think that this will help you with whatever you might be facing. What were your plans before the coronavirus? What were your plans for retirement? Plans for vacation? Easter? What are your plans for Friday night? What were they? They're all dust now, aren't they? What are your plans now? What do you do now? Are we like the disciples and still preparing for Easter? Are we getting ready? Are we like Mary, trying to give honor to God and just not knowing exactly how and and getting a little bit of pushback? Or are we like Judas and the priests looking for this opportunity to get what we can out of an already bad situation? When I look at scripture leading up to the crucifixion, I find that there's only one person who never had their plans interrupted, and that's Jesus. His plans were never interrupted because he was prepared for God to move. Even the high priests wanted to wait until after the feast to get and keep this, this killing of Jesus a secret. And Judas was caught off guard when he realized, Jesus knows what I am doing. And I, really, I personally think that that forced his hand. I think Jesus was in control of his own timetable. I think he let Jesus, Judas know that he was on to him so that he would go and rush these plans so that he would be crucified on the Passover and not after it. His plans were never interrupted. Mary and the disciples might have expected Jesus to be honored, not crucified. God interrupts our plans with his plan, but his plan is never interrupted or stopped. He will accomplish his will. In keeping with the Passover, Jesus holds this prepared meal with his disciples and things change. He's trying to prepare them, but things change here. And so it's really important that we kind of stop and and look at it. And this is what I want to dig into tonight, or today. Verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink of it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they all went out to the Mount of Olives. 
the Passover Seder is traditionally broken into four sections. This, this new institution that we are about to go into. The Passover Seder is four sections. Each section corresponds with a promise that God gave to Israel in Exodus 6.6. 6, that he would sanctify his people, deliver them from bondage, redeem them, and make them his people. And so each section is accompanied traditionally with a cup of wine. And it is thought that Jesus stopped the meal here at the third cup, the cup of redemption. So as he is going through this ceremony, he stops to institute what we know as communion and brings new meaning to it through the Passover. And so this is well thought that our tradition of communion uh, it was actually pulled from a shortened version of a Passover meal. The unleavened bread is traditionally broken, representing the breaking of the bondage of Egypt. And so the bread represents bondage, and it is broken. It now represents the body of Jesus broken for our sanctification, the breaking of our sin. But then the wine represents the blood of the Lamb who brings salvation and deliverance from the wrath of God. The lamb without blemish would not only have to be slain, but the blood would be applied to the doorposts and the lintel above the door. Jesus calls this his blood of the covenant poured out for man for the forgiveness of sins. His blood is poured out for our forgiveness. He applies this new meaning, and he enriches this Passover feast by giving it this new meaning. He doesn't just change the symbolism. He fulfills it. The point here being that the Exodus, yes, it, it brought this meaning back then, but even more, it is fulfilled through Jesus, through this act, and is given this new meaning because he ultimately fulfills it in a greater way. Just as Israel and Egypt had their bondage broken and were passed over by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus establishes a new covenant through the brokenness of his body and his blood put up on a post and a lintel. What is even more fascinating is in verse 29, Jesus says he will not drink this wine again until the day that we are together in his Father's kingdom. In the meal, in the Seder meal, the fourth and final cup is the cup of praise. Some call it Elijah's cup, where we're looking expectantly for the arrival of the Messiah. Uh, we're, we're looking for Elijah because he's going to herald the coming of the Messiah, and so we're looking for this Messiah expectantly. And if this passage correctly corresponds to this tradition, then Jesus is saying he is waiting to celebrate with us in his kingdom. How incredible is that? Jesus wants to celebrate with us. And when we celebrate Easter and Passover, we are not just celebrating what God has done. We are celebrating what he is doing and what he will do in the future. His past faithfulness shows us that the future is securely in his hands, that the present is securely in his hands. His plans will not be foiled. And so we are celebrating his promises to bring us into his glory, his presence. God's plan is to provide a way for us to be with him through the forgiveness of our sins. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. A lot of times we think this is an exclusive statement, and it is. But look at the way he starts it. I am the way. I have created this way. How amazing is it that we actually have a way? There wasn't one before. We have a way. This is the new covenant described by the prophet Jeremiah in 31, 33.
But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. <sighs> what a day that will be. Church, one of the first things I am anxious to do with you is to celebrate communion with you here in this church. That's one of the first things I want to do. I want to make it a priority. And it should be a priority. And what a day that will be, but even greater when we get to celebrate with our Lord and Savior, when we get to be in his presence, and he says, I'm going to drink that cup now. You're here. If you have not confessed your sins to Christ and been reconciled to God, please make today that day because we want to celebrate with you. Call us at the church. Send us a Facebook message. Leave a comment. We'd be glad to get in touch with you and talk to you about it. But there's one last thing I feel that we need to look at. One last thing. After the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples headed out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus says something very distressing. Verse 31 of Matthew 26. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Jesus says they'll all be scattered. What are we now? We're scattered. They are scattered because of fear and persecution. We are scattered because of the coronavirus. We know that they were scattered because every disciple ran away when Jesus was arrested. Everyone. Peter and John eventually came back, but even Peter ran away because he denied Jesus three times that very night with Jesus on the other side of the garden. They were scattered. But look at what he says there. I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Well, we know the disciples came together in Galilee just like Jesus commanded. If you were to just go a, a couple of pages to chapter 28, verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. His disciples, who all fled and ran, were there and met him on Galilee for what is known as the Great Commission. What can we draw from this? God's mission is still his plan. He is still on mission. Our plans have been destructed. They are dust. He is still going strong. And because his mission is still going strong, our mission that he has given us is still going strong. No matter where we go, who we're with, whether our jobs are, are, or we are quarantined in our homes, this is what he is concerned with the salvation of his people through the passing over of our sins. This was always his plan. This is still his plan. John 16, 32 through 33. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. 
In the world you will have much tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Though we are distant, we are still comforted, we are still unified, we are still empowered by the Holy Spirit living within us. He is not limited by physical boundaries, and we can have peace because Christ has overcome the world. Let us rest in that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We, thankful, we are so thankful that you have overcome the world. We are thankful that you are there and despite whatever is happening in this world, despite all hope being lost, despite seeing things, uh, being surprised by things that we don't know are going on, despite losing our jobs, despite losing our retirement, despite uh, just being scared to walk out our front door, your plan is still in effect, that you still have control over it, that you are still uh, keeping to your timing. Lord, we pray that you would bring an end to this coronavirus, that you would bring uh, success back into our lives, Lord. But we pray that you would not let this pass without us all turning to you, repenting and coming to know you as our Savior, Lord. We worship you. You are incredible. And may our entire nation come to see that. May our entire world come to see that. Because your mission is the same as it always has been, to love us and to be with us. May we celebrate this now. We love you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.